Hi, I'm Dan Robinson with the Great Lakes Spirituality Project, and I'm happy to continue the conversation with Dr. Margaret Wooster, who is with us today. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Good Glad you're here. here. Glad you're here again. Um, and appreciate you making the time to talk again. Uh, Margaret is a writer, a conservationist, community planner, and nonprofit executive. She served for eight, eight years as the executive director of Great Lakes United, a binational coastal coalition of environmental labor and indigenous groups dedicated to conserving the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River ecosystem. She was also a founding member of the Friends of the Buffalo River, which eventually led to Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper. And more to the point of our conversation today, she is an author. She's written three books, including Living Waters, Reading the Rivers of the Lower Great Lakes. And she just published this book right here, Meander, Making Room for Rivers. And uh, I, I understand you had your book release this past Wednesday. Is that right? It was. It was it. Yeah. What? What's today? Friday. Yeah. Two days ago. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations on that. How did that go? It went really well. We were having terrible weather, and I felt bad because I, sixty people were coming, and it looked like we were, were on the lake, actually on the river, and uh, we were going to be outside. And it was thunderstorms and heavy oh. rain predicted. And um, but I I know from camping we we often start out in thunderstorms and heavy rains and then when we get you know it just always gets better, so I figured you know it was worth the test of everybody that we would and sure enough we you know we I had a little string band there they played and the clouds lifted and we had a gorgeous afternoon. Oh, wonderful! So it was really nice. Well, great. Well, your your experience of camping is just the opposite of me. I usually start off nice and then we end up with rain. So I'm glad it turned out that way. <laughs> well, for you. That's good. <laughs> well, to, to start with, um, I just want to ask you about the title of the book. Why did you title it Meander? Because this book started with a particular place, the Oxbow Wetland on Buffalo Creek which is the first, uh, I would say, you know, water place in this region that I've lived in all my life that I really got to know. And um, so, and it is, it's a cutoff meander. Uh, the Oxbow is a cutoff meander from Buffalo Creek. And, you know, when we first met it, um, I was working with Waterkeeper and it was 2007. And um, a, we, um, well, anyway, we got, long story short, we got a grant to do some work there. Oh, no, no, it was even before that. We were looking for a, a reference community for restoring the Lower Buffalo River, and there was nothing in the city of Buffalo you could possibly use, <laughs> and uh, so we went upstream, and the first place upstream that the biologists thought was viable as a sort of model or, you know, of, uh, of, um, of what the river was like, and also as a possible seed bank of animals and plants, was this oxbow. And um, so that's why we were interested in finding it, and that's how we thought of it. And then as it turned out, because it had been cut off, it was a very problematical place, and a lot of deaths occurred there. And um, so that's that was the whole thing. It was a great place, and it still is. I love this place. I bonded with this place. Um, I've definitely learned way more from this place than from almost anywhere else, um, including, you know, the, the dark side. Well, let's, let's, before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about that. Cause you mentioned some people had died there. Um, now my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that those deaths resulted from, um, structures that had been built on the river, not because of the river itself. Do I, do I understand that correctly? Exactly. Those deaths occurred because it was a meander. It's actually the cover of my book is, is that meander. That is Buffalo Creek. And you can oh. just see sort of here, you can see part of the part of the meander. Uh, and um, so, yeah, it was um, it was cut off because, uh, well, for a variety of reasons. And um and then they put in these five low head dams to slow down the river because once they cut off that long meander, it was, you know, straight from A to B kind of thing, a much faster course. And uh, so they tried to slow it down. And that once you start messing with the river's flow, um, you know, uh, what happened was the, the last uh, dam became a hydraulic boil 
uh, became a very unstable kind of one. When, when we had heavy water, it just rolled back on itself. And so people got caught in it and died, drowned at that last sill. So that happened. And even a water rescuer who went in to save one of the people um, got drowned. So that's how forceful it was. <clears throat> wow. Wow. That, 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 that's really tragic. I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry to, to hear about that. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've talked about this last time, and this is one of the topics I wanted to follow up on when we had our conversation now. And that was this idea of struggle and grief in a way in the work that we do trying to protect not it could be any place but certainly that includes the great lakes basin and the rivers and in in western new york and i i guess i i kind of wondering um what has been your experience with with that i that sort of that that struggle side of the of the work that we're doing and and how do you deal with that how do you how do you address that for you personally um well you know, I've certainly experienced it a lot, and um, um, and I, you know, was probably pretty pessimistic um, for a long time about how, you know, how this was all working out for our waters, for our streams, and um, but I have, I do have some good stories of, of of how it turned around, and it only is now that I really understand how good these stories are, but. Um, you know, for example, the Oxbow, I, you know, I think we first started going there in 2007 and, um, and, you know, worked on it continually. I'm still going out there, um, a lot and, um, uh, you know, it's still there. It, it amazes me because there's nobody taking care of it. Um, nobody really owns it. It's just no man's land. Um, and yet it's this remarkable place. And, um, and so I'm always fearful when I go to think, oh my God, what, is, what will they have done? But somehow or another, it's still there pretty much as it was. And um, so that gives me hope. And then I look back on my career working with streams and um, we have another stream that's, that's buried um, three and a half miles under the city in our, it's in our sewer system, Skajakwita Creek. And then it surfaces in a cemetery and there's a waterfalls there. And then under the cemetery, I didn't know this, nobody knows this, are 30 springs. There's a little localized aquifer under the cemetery and all these springs. And so by the time this creek, when it comes into the cemetery through a pipe, through a culvert, there's nothing. There's the slightest trickle of water when it leaves the cemetery about a mile of meander later, it's a full blown stream again. And to the, to me, this is astonishing, but you know, you have to trust me, this, this is what it is. <laughs> and um, so how is that? And so that's what gives me hope. What gives me hope is how stupid we are. <laughs> like how little we see, how little we know. And that's both bad and, and it's not good, but at least it's it's a possibility that maybe we don't really know that there's some hidden connections, some possible resilience, something left over. And I I I, I now I, I I think that all the time. Yeah. Oh. I suppose that's that's the the advantage of having a, a, a history of, work, of this work that you can look back and see from those experiences um, things maybe turned out better than you thought they might have at one point. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not positive about that, but I do have one other story from Buffalo Creek, um, which is that, um, and, you know, we'll probably talk about that, but that's the star of the, of the book Meander. And uh, we worked there with, we probably the main thing that we did there was work with uh, hundreds of people. Lots of kids came out. We were doing restoration, it was easy, easy type of work. It was weeding and, and planting and wrapping trees against beaver and deer, you know, the usual. And we had, we really literally did have hundreds and hundreds of people come at, you know, over a period of, of seven or eight or 10 years, however long we, we did. And uh, from Girl Scouts to prisoners, you know, and uh, we always like count from the county jail who, you know, I don't know if it was punishment for them. I think it was a good thing. It was like, you know, a day out on the river. And um, 
And one of these, one of the kids, one of these little girls found a muscle, a, a, pocket, a pocketbook muscle. It's lamp, uh, lamps, lampsilis ovata um, in the, in this little waterfalls that we walk to. Uh, usually after we're done working, we walk up to this beautiful little waterfall and the kids are having lunch and everyone's splashing around. And even there was a transformation because the kids started out, you know, these are like middle school kids and they're, you know, what, 12 and 13, and they're, they were pretty jaded, you know, they didn't even want to come, and when we got to the waterfall, they were, like, elated, you know, it was a beautiful day, they took off their shoes, they were jumping around, it was, you know, it's a beautiful but safe low waterfall, and this girl found this mussel, and it turned out to be a species that the DEC says is locally extirpated, and has oh. been this I forget 1995 or something. And um, so I sent in pictures and they confirmed that that is what it was. And, um, and then the kids, I mean, before, before I did all that, the, the kids found more. I mean, it wasn't just this one, there was a little bed of these pocketbook mussels at the foot of this waterfall in the pools below the waterfall. And so I think other people found things like that too, not just us, but the DEC revised their list and took the took it off the extirpated list, along with a couple other things. So people must have, you know, reported. And so the point there is just that sometimes, you know, we're not out there looking, you know, and sometimes we make these pronouncements and statements about what's, you know, that things are extinct or extirpated locally. And sometimes they're not because they're, they don't, you know, I know here that those biologists, they are totally overworked and they're not out, you know, on the streams every day. There's too much, you know, coverage um, to, 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 to cover. So um, I, that also gives me hope. It's like, you know, what we don't see, um, we, you know, cause we're not out there looking. So I think that's what I've decided is my, purpose in life is to help people see the the wonder the mysteries the greatness of what's here wow that's a great story oh thanks for sharing that um well i you know a little bit and again you can correct me if i'm wrong but a little bit behind what i'm hearing you're saying is our own limitations we're not always able to see the things or anticipate even in the future what the results of these actions that we take are and, and so one of the things, it, it struck me behind the, the themes behind the book, Meander, and just symbolized in that name, is the idea. Now, you talk about some of the rivers um, in Western New York having been constricted. They're not able to meander anymore. We sort of channelize them and, and make them kind of go in the direction we want them to go. And, mm -hmm. and I kind of found that sort of this idea sort of where we try, rather than us adapting to the world around us, we try to make the world fit our sort of our preconceived notions. And one of the parts of the book that I that just, I mean, I, I'm very familiar with this concept, run across it lots of times, but it just kind of struck me in your book was where you talked about um, way back a couple hundred years ago when the Holland Land Company um, purchased this land in Western New York, and they started to lay down grid lines that were that were sort of uh, ways of selling the land off, but it didn't fit the land at all. No. And 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 so whether it's constricting rivers or trying to divide up land in a ways that don't make sense. Um, and I'm going to put this as our spirituality terms. I feel like what I'm hearing is we don't allow people, the land, the water or even people for that matter, be who or what they were created to be. We try to sort of make them fit into a box and even and i even got that sense when you talked about the story uh with the seneca and and losing their land um have, so do, do i have that right i mean do you think that's the case and and why do you suppose that is huh. well um the um some people will say it's always been this way you know people come and they conquer land and they don't really you know the whole concept of conquering, you know, if you're invading a place and taking it over, you haven't co-evolved with that place. So you're, you know, it's almost suits your purpose to be blind to it and impose your vision. And, and, and so in that sense, you know, there's that, but I mean, what happened here, um, 
oh, I forget his name, but there's a great book about Western New York called The Developer's Frontier, which um, says that, you know, the Holland Land Company that originally bought these 3 million acres of land west of the Genesee River all the way, all the way west to Lake Erie, um, they, um, you know, they didn't live here. None of the, there was a group of six bankers who lived in Amsterdam. They never even came here, but they bought it. Um, and that's a whole long story too. Um, and, and then proceeded to hire Joseph Ellicott, the surveyor to, you know, to, to cut it up into grids. They never even referred to it as land. They always referred to it as the purchase. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and so, so the whole land was, uh, divided up into, I think it's six, the towns are like six by six, six miles by six miles. And, um, and then they named everything after Holland, you know, so Buffalo was New Amsterdam. And, um, you know, so, so that's how that's, that was, you know, that's, that's why it is we, we, we impose, you know, what we know, partly because, what you know what we know always comes first and partly because it suits our purpose you know suited their purpose to have it all platted up into you know tinier and tinier squares that you could sell and they're you know they're on my deed the deed to my house is says um uh, wilhelm willink and company and he was the head of the holland land company the chief bank he's on my own deed oh wow Wow, I, I you know I've never I've often thought about going back and searching the property records for the places that I've been, but I haven't done that. That's an interesting, yeah. Yeah, I think it's title. I think it's the word is title. Yeah. Yeah. So this this idea of trying to sort of make the place fit us rather than the other way around, what what effect do you think that mindset has on the health of the Great Lakes Basin and the people that and the creatures that exist here? Well, if you read the histories of what they what the people found when they first came here, you know, came up the St. Lawrence River and into Lake Ontario and, and the Genesee, all the different rivers, the Finger Lakes in Western New York or Central New York, it is it's astonishing. I mean, what uh, what a huge <laughs> it's it's sort of how we may look at the savannas of Africa or something there the animals, the fish, the, you know, you could stick a pitchfork into the, into the creek and, and get dinner, you know, you didn't, you know, there were just so many um, sturgeon and salmon and um, uh, lake trout and, uh, you know, and uh, the, uh, this whole migratory uh, aspect of the fishery of fish, you know, from the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean coming up the St. Lawrence River and then into, you know, all the lakes. Well, not not above Niagara Falls, but everything below Niagara Falls. It's just amazing. So there was this plenitude and um, and people just took it for granted and killed and killed randomly, you know, just like we did the buffalo. We killed, we killed the fish. Um, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of extirpation happening um, with settlement. And it was part of it was to get it out of the way, and part of it really was random acts of violence, I would say. Hmm. Well, towards towards the end of the book, because you just obviously just wrote it and published it, you, you draw a parallel with the, with the coronavirus pandemic. And, and you wrote in the book, the pandemic has awakened many more of us to the understanding that there is no future in unlimited growth and consumption. We need to find a more stable footing grounded in the way things are, in the natural laws of a finite planet, mm -hmm. which I thought was a great quote. And so so how, more specifically to our time, how, how do you see the pandemic changing the relationship people have with the Great Lakes, Great Lakes waters and the land in the future? Do, do you see that as a pivot point at all? I do. And I think it's helping us a little bit now because um, as land, you know, if land has, if, 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 the, if any value of land is recognized by say developers, it's, um, you know, it's how developable is it? And, um, and developability is based, you know, in part as everyone who buys a house knows it's a location, location, location. So um, 
the um, outer harbor where we've been fighting for since 2014, I think was, was when it was first sold to the state and uh, actually it was earlier, but anyway, when they first came up with the plan, the outer harbor um, uh, is, is under threat of development and has been, and we've had to sue, we've got, you know, we've, <laughs> we've lost one lawsuit um, and there's another one in progress basically against the uh, development corporation and the city for not following environmental law. They're not doing the state Envi environmental quality review act. They're not, they never, there is rarely a type one action that would lead to a, um, to an environmental impact statement and a public hearing, uh, which is what we want. We want the public to be involved in these decisions. Um, I think, you know, we've had years, recent years, where in all six counties west of the Genesee, there was one, one environmental impact statement was required. And there's been thousands of major development projects, you know, throughout these counties. So they rarely do it. And um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. What was you, what was you asking? <laughs> That's okay. I was, I was just asking if you see the pandemic as kind of a pivot point. Oh, yeah. And so what happened with the pandemic, so we've been fighting this for a while, but with the pandemic, when people couldn't travel and, you know, and we're pretty much stuck, stuck in Buffalo, stuck at home, a lot of people started using the Outer Harbor because it's, it's still undeveloped largely. And so you can drive or ride a bike there. There's one bus that goes there. And, um, and you can spend, you know, a, a day with your family and it's, it's not ideal. You can't really put your toes in the water because there's so much riprap and hard edge and so forth, but there is still, it's beautiful. Um, there are trails, there are sunsets, there are sailboats, there's fishing, anybody can fish, you know, and that's that, so that these last couple of years through the pandemic, there have been crowds and very diverse, very, you know, racially and ethnically diverse uh, crowds too. Burmese, Buffalo is, you know, sort of a immigrant destination. Um, we're getting people from Afghanistan now and we have a huge, not a huge, but I think it's like 1% of our population is Burmese. And so they're actually using the river and the outer harbor to fish and they're eating the fish, it's a big part of their diet, very complicated. <laughs> But um, the, um, the point is, is that a lot more people care about the Outer Harbor than ever used to because, you know, most people thought, well, once this industry is left, it was kind of a no man's land. And um, so, uh, you know, so the pandemic's been good in a way because people have had to pay attention to home, like where we live, you know, how, what shape is it? Can I go swimming? Can I eat the fish? you know, more people are, are needing to know this. And um, that's good. You've come back to that theme a couple of different times about people paying attention and sort of seeing what's going on around them and, and, and noticing that. Um, you know, I'm someone who's moved around quite a bit in the Midwest and, and the Great Lakes, but you're somebody who has stayed in Buffalo and I think you stood in the house that you're in for like 40 years. Do I understand that correctly? I think 40 years, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's my, my son was born. Anyway, maybe it's 38, but yeah. Yeah. So what difference do you think it makes in terms of that seeing that you're talking about? Um, noticing things and, and understanding them, having been in a place for a long period of time versus someone like me who's moved around quite a bit. I think a lot. I mean, the first book that I wrote was a guidebook called Somewhere to Go on Sunday. <laughs> Um, and uh, it was just a guidebook to natural places in Western New York. And um, um, and so I think I, I didn't really think, actually I was you know sort of commissioned to write that book. It wasn't my idea. And so I didn't really think of myself as a guide, but I do now, I, I do feel like um, I've lived here long enough that I know a lot about where things are and how things work. And I do have a memory of a lot of things that were better and a lot of things that were worse. So, um, yeah, I feel very committed on the one hand to, you know, improve to leaving it better than I found it here. And also to sharing what I know with, um, you know, anybody who will listen or I took, you know, taking people. This book has given me access to some groups of people. I, I just took a little 
bunch to the Oxbow on a field trip. Um, it was great. These these are water quality experts, and they've never been to the Oxbow. I couldn't believe it. So, hmm. yeah. So it sounds like at this point in your journey that that um, guide sort of image of helping people see and, and notice these things sort of it, it, through your books and through the work is kind of what you feel called to do is that stretching it do you think no that's what i feel you know i have colleagues so i'm i'm with this loose <laughs> you know non incorporated nonprofit uh, coalition called the our outer harbor coalition and we got together uh, i think it was 2017 no not what where anyway whatever yeah about 6 years ago um, and it was in response to one of these, you know, re terrible uh, proposals for the Outer Harbor, you know, just wanting to it's, it's sprawl, really, basically, to put residential development out there. Our Outer Harbor has no residential development. It was, you know, purely industrial. And, um, and so to put residences out there now is crazy, especially with the, the climate as unstable as it is. But... Um, yeah, I think um, we all woke up, not all, but I mean, we at least the coalition members woke up to, you know, this is this place is under threat, we better be able to sort of demonstrate what it is, and what's great about it. And so we've been not just me, but a lot of us have been working on that. Well, I love that image of, of um helping people see what's going on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's a great way. It's a great spot to end our conversation. So Margaret, thank you very much for the time to talk. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Dan. It and was a congratu pleasure. Congratulations on the book again. Again, that's Meander, Making Room for Rivers. I yep. encourage everybody to, to check that out. And, um, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Dan. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.